Hello, early music fans, and welcome to this episode of the Early Music Podcast with me, Andrew Byrne. A- Andrew Byrne. And today I'm speaking with Olga Pashenko, Dutch based international artist and keyboardist. As we listen to some recordings of her latest album of Beethoven sonatas, we're going to be talking about early keyboard instruments, how they work why they were and are so popular, and we'll get into whether there really is a point to be playing early music on early instruments. I mean, isn't any keyboard music just better on the grand piano? Red alert. So, are you ready for this? All right, shall we punch it? This is the Early Music Podcast with your host, Andrew Byrne. Brought to you by Rayma. The Early Music Network. Kawabunga. Episode 5. Olga Pashenko, regardless of the era and specific instrument used, why is it that the keyboard instrument is so central to Western classical music? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, Keyboard instruments are very colorful, I would say. And there are those instruments who have both melodic line and the harmony. So it's a very sort of full setting with only one person, actually. So yeah, it's a very uh, attractive thing to play for everybody because you just have suddenly the whole thing. A song needs, for example, you have the melody, you have the accompaniment everything at the same time. Could you list the most popular keyboard instruments in use over the last five centuries? Um, It's quite a rich list, I would say, and also very different, differently sounding. So we have an organ, of course, the pipe organ, the clavichord, we have a harpsichord, early fortepianos, and then the whole evolution that eventually brings us to the modern piano and to the electronic piano. Well, those are all keyboard instruments, so they all must function the same, right? Right? Wrong. So let's go through a brief description of two of the instruments that Olga mentioned, the harpsichord and the forte piano. The harpsichord is a wing-shaped keyboard instrument, which also takes the name cembalo or clavicembalum. It also has different versions of the instrument with different shapes called the spinet or virginal, but all of these instruments have a mechanism which acts roughly the same. The keys on the harpsichord act as levers. When a key is pressed down, the other end would tilt up, like on a seesaw. A jack, a thin wooden slab, sits atop the far end of the lever. On the face of the jack hangs a plectrum that plucks the string as it is being lifted upwards. This plectrum was historically a quill from a bird's feather cut very finely and angled slightly up. The jack would be stopped from flying out of the harpsichord by a jack rail, a board of wood which would sit above the strings trapping the jacks in. And I know, I know it's hard to visualize all of this, but in any case, if you're more of a visual learner, then go ahead and click on the link in the show notes to the episode's webpage where you can see more about harpsichord. If the key remained held, the string would continue resonating. As soon as the key were released, though, the lever would be lowering the jack back down. Now, I know what you're thinking. Won't the plectrum strike again on its way back down? Well, amazingly, no, because these jacks were cleverly designed. When the bottom edge of the plectrum began to touch the string, a sort of trapdoor mechanism would be activated, swinging the plectrum away from the string. Meanwhile, a damper, which rested atop the jack, would fall on the vibrating string to silence its sound on the way down. Softer plectra, or they were fixed at different positions in relation to the string. You will often find harpsichords with two or more sets of strings offering choices for different sound qualities, just like stops on the organ, and you can even choose to play them at the same time. That's called coupling the strings for a louder or fuller sound. Finally, we come to the pianoforte, or piano, or forte piano, or as it was very firstly described, grave cembalo col piano e forte. (laughs) 
Piano mechanisms are difficult to summarize in brief because there are just so many parts. Going back before the time of the piano, in 1636, Marie Marsenne wrote that the harpsichord of his day contained 1,500 components. Today, the modern piano has almost 10 times as many, and most of them are found in the mechanisms relating to the action of striking the string. Again, if you'd like to see more about how the piano functions, then go ahead to the episode's webpage. The link is in the show notes. But here is a brief description of the action. To start with, a piano key, acting as a lever, raises a whippin, which drives an L-shaped jack into a hammer roller. This, in turn, triggers another lever, causing a hammer to hit a string. Hammers are made out of wood and covered with soft material. In a modern grand piano, the hammers rest horizontally and need to be lifted against gravity to hit the string. Because of this, a grand piano's keys are weighted with lead. Depending on the note being played, piano strings can be single for the lowest notes or in sets of two or three for the highest notes. These strings were originally made of iron, but are now made from tempered high carbon steel. Now, of course, there were tremendous differences between the forte piano that Ludwig van Beethoven would have known versus the modern grand piano. So, Olga, could you tell us a bit about those differences? Well, for me, the main differences are that the registers of a forte piano that is straight strung, basically. The registers just sound differently, so... Just for clarification, she means that the registers within the same instrument sound differently. The polyphony, for example, is much easier to get out like you don't have to sweat on if you have a fugue or like a fugato or something that involves polyphony it's just much more it's just clearer because the modern piano sounds much more homogeneous right now um the of course we hear it's like the pitch is higher the pitch is lower but it's basically one one animal <laughs> on the forte piano it's a whole team let's say well modern piano is a <laughs> big black beast I would say, uh, which I also love, I must confess. Um, a very good modern piano has beautiful sound. Uh, it has the length of the sound. It has the depth of the sound, but it lacks the graphics of a forte piano. So the, mo the modern forte piano got uh, cross-strung uh, at the end of the 19th century. It got massive iron frame. It doesn't get so easily out of tune, um, but for everything you have to pay. So it lost the qualities that the forte piano, who is a more fragile instrument, had. It lost the differences in registers. Um, it lost, let's say, compared to a six and a half octave Viennese forte piano, it lost uh, quite some pedals also. As the piano is one of the most dominant instruments in Western music today, it is no surprise then that so much of the repertoire from past eras, which were written for other keyboard instruments, is performed on the piano today. Because this instrument, the piano, is a more, let's call it, technologically advanced instrument and has a wider array of expressive devices, are the performances of, let's say, the music of J.S. Bach, his keyboard music, are they just better on the piano? I think music is the same, whether you play it on an accordion or a xylophone or marimba or piano or clavichord. Bach can be really beautiful on a modern piano if it's played with a sense of stylistics and with some knowledge and with the good taste as C.P. Bach always was writing, <laughs> whatever that means. For me, it's a little bit more like an arrangement. It's just a little bit of pity that the modern piano became such a idol that we put it on the podium and that is the only thing that many people know. When we talk about the modern performance of music which comes from the early music repertoire, so this could be early forte piano music or harpsichord works or organ works, there are two canons today. One being the mainstream classical tradition with generations upon generations of musical editions and recordings, performances, all taking place on the piano and informed by the prevalent mainstream culture and aesthetic. And the other that was consciously established by the early music movement of the 1960s, where the music is performed on the appropriate instrument and is informed by the writings of scholars and musicians and theorists uh, who are contemporary to that musical work. I'm speaking in very large generalizations here. 
Curiously, there are also examples of a convergence of these canons. With the rise of the early music tradition, some musicians in the mainstream classical tradition have adopted, incorporated, or at least show influences in their own performances of pre-piano repertoire. Now for the question. By doing that borrowing from the early music movement, do those mainstream performers create a more legitimate performance? I don't judge the whether the performance is legitimate. I think everything is legitimate as long as one likes it or someone likes it. So the audience likes it. I think everybody has a voice and even if it's a very conservative performance, but you got the conservative audience and they, they only want that. I think it's always good to shake them a little bit <laughs> to, to, to change uh, this uh, conservatism a little bit. But I mean, if people like it, then that'd be it. It's, um, I mean, everything has a right to be. But of course, I think nowadays in the modern world, it's uh, very welcome when people actually have had some knowledge and have deepened themselves into learning and discovering what the composer actually meant with it. I mean, we can never call Bach and ask, that. is it le legitimate what I do? Like, did you mean it like this? We don't know. I mean, unfortunately, there are no recordings of that era. And um, yeah, we can just read, interpret what we read in the treatises and try. And then sometimes the puzzle gets together and you think, yeah, that's the right thing. Now that the early music movement is no longer in its infancy, and that harpsichords and other early keyboards are available to play in most major European conservatories, and there's also numerous instrument builders who now earn their living exclusively making these early keyboards, why isn't it that we haven't seen a much later repertoire tackled on early instruments? You mean playing um, Rachmaninoff on a harpsichord? For example. Well, no, they were. There are quite some attempts playing Shostakovich, Preludes and Fugue on the harpsichord by Olga Martino, for example, a whole CD of that. Again, I think it's absolutely legitimate because why not experiment? That was the idea of those times to experiment to have. Diversity. I mean, we talk about diversity nowadays very often. And this is exactly what historical informed performance gives us. Because uh, I think some of the modern players, they're afraid of this rule that you read the treatise and that only must be like this and nothing else is possible. And this is, for me personally, absolutely not what historical informed performance is about. Uh, because I think we do interpret treatises also ourselves. Of course, there are some things that are black and white, but experimenting, uh, looking for new colors, uh, trying things out, that was, that's how humanity developed also. That's how all these wonderful instruments were being built, because just the makers who said, oh, let's try something else, let me put strings uh, other way, let me put brass strings instead of iron strings, uh, let me try to make a hammer. Uh, from leather, no, from paper, and, and, and so on. And then I think composers and the makers, they were always working somehow together. So there is always a balance between saying, oh, for sure Beethoven would have loved the Steinway. I think this is absolutely not possible because I just know that a Steinway does not have the colors that a graph does, that are just so natural for his late repertoire, for Beethoven's late, late repertoire. Um, when you play music on the historical instruments, it just makes suddenly so much sense. It just falls into the right place. Olga Pashenko, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> That's it for this, the fifth episode of the third season of the Early Music Podcast. Special thanks to Holly Scarborough for extra background information on this episode. In the next episode, I speak with medieval music specialist, harpist, and vocalist Benjamin Bagby about the heyday of the early music movement and his ensemble's performances of the music of Hildegard von Bingen. Thanks for listening.